Welcome to Ask Girl Anything. This is the show where your questions make the show. If I don't have questions, I don't have a show. This is for October. This is the first weekend in October. Um, I did a live stream in the end of, uh, I did actually did two live streams. I did a test live stream and then I did a live stream with Chadwick Perry. Um, the end of September. And I did one Ask Girl Anything for September. Um, this is a... Uh, I'm in a new season, you know, um, I, I felt like the month of August, I needed a little space and time to kind of figure some things out. <clears throat> and now that I'm into October, I'm really feeling like what I really need to do is just find my pace of what I want to do and what I don't want to do and how I want to do it. Um, I feel some changes coming down the pike, uh, for me in a lot of different areas, and you'll probably see them as time goes on. But um, I'm still putting out videos almost daily. I think it's just me just cathartically letting stuff out there. I'm not so sure the world cares anymore. Or I don't know if the world ever cared. I have friends that care. And I always thank the subscribers and the people that watch my shows and care about my videos. And comment on my videos or like my videos. Um, I think that's awesome, and the comments are awesome, and I've made some great friends here on YouTube, and I really appreciate all of you, and I try to support you as much as I possibly can. Um, but the world of drum covers compared to the rest of the world of YouTube and everybody in it, and now there's lots of different places to take our mind off of things like TikTok and Instagram. You know, Instagram statistics are so much fun to read. When you realize you're up there putting your 53 second video on Instagram and people are watching it for a, a total of two seconds, you know the attention span of the human race is just getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So how can a long form show like Ask Girl Anything survive? But some of you like to hear things about drums and I keep the this show really focused on drums, drummers. And what's going on. So today I'm going to talk uh, a few drum rants, a few YouTube rants. I have some questions. I'm going to share a few things from what's going on for me. And one of the things I want to share for you is, you know, I've, I've said this in the past. I don't practice a lot. But in the last couple weeks, I did pick up a new book. And the new book is Steve Gadd's Gadamits. Now... I can tell you I've only got to page one and two on this. I have look at a few other pages and I've goofed around with. But to be honest with you, one and two are enough to work on for months for me probably. Because they are two very cool exercises for warm-up. And I'm starting to get it. Um, the first warm-up is, is like a eight-stroke roll into single-stroke roll into double paradiddle right right handed and then you go four measures of it end on a left on the fourth measure on number four on met on beat four then you switch it to left so steve has really done a great job of working both sides of our hands not letting us live in the right handed thing and i'm really kind of enjoying it so that's the i'm working on that back to rights. That's the page one. Page two, I'm not as good, but um, don't. that was kind of off the cuff. I did that for you, but I'm working on my, my doubles, my singles. I'm working with a metronome. It's really a good book. And one of the things I realized, and this is why I connect to Gad's book, is that I have learned to play drums in the tradition of rudiments, and phrasing and playing music as opposed to the linear things. And I mean, I do some linear patterns, but I don't identify 
with the linear style of drumming as being my main influence. I think my influence really comes from the phrasing that comes out of listening to Steve Gadd play Rudiments. And I was watching Steve Gadd on, a, on an interview recently where somebody asked him about linear playing, and he kind of asked, like, what do you mean by linear? That's what he said. And I thought that was rather telling that Steve Gadd really isn't keeping up with the current trends. He's playing what he plays. And his whole thing came out of Rudiments. So this book really gives you a picture of what makes Steve Gadd so musical. Now, there's a guy on YouTube I'm going to shout out to, Ruben Von Roon. He's from the Netherlands. He does a lot of Steve Gadd breakdowns. If you're into Steve Gadd, you want to check out his channel. Ruben is a great drummer. He's a professor at a university. He's played with Candy, Candy Duffler. I think I've mentioned him before, but... Um, he really speaks to how Gad was influenced by the rudimental side and phrasing and playing. It's really playing music. So I really find his channel to be rather inspiring. And with the Gadamans book, it's kind of opening up some things because that first little thing I just did on the pad was really Steve Gad's warm up. It's warm up number one, and then there's warm up number two. And that's how he starts. He's been doing it probably for years. And it really, really opened you up. So I want to I wanna encourage you to keep learning. I'm going to keep trying to learn, keep trying to grow. I think that's the key to playing music is growing. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to grow. And it's not that I'm not working on linear stuff. I am working on linear stuff. I'm trying to figure out some of the linear playing. But I realize that the linear playing comes from an approach of balanced left and right. And I have developed a really strong right side and a very weaker left side. That was something John Robinson said to me. And for the last year, I've been working on my left side. And I think the GAD book is going to help me even more. So anyhow, that's the little freebie up front uh, warm-up uh, lesson. And let's jump into the questions of Ask Girl Anything. And I'll have a couple more rants before the end of this, I'm sure. <clears throat> All right, the first question comes from Steve Zinn. He asked, um, this was on the Logical song, the Supertramp song, where I did some Rototoms. He said, I recently bought a 2002 18-inch crash that sounds great. By the way, I don't have the 2002 18-inch crash set up on this kit. Right now it's on the other kit. But I love that crash symbol. That is one of the most beautiful crash symbols I've ever owned in my life. I mean, it's just perfect. Um, and that married to the Giant B20 Multi is like the perfect crash, those two together. They're perfect. Um, I love that symbol. But he said, mine has some black grime around the bell and the edges that I would love to remove. I read on the Peisty site that they have a protective coating on their symbols and they recommend using their own proprietary cleaners only, but they no longer sell it. I'm hopeful that you might have some safe suggestions to remove the grime, but not the logos. Okay, Steve, let, let me say this about this. Um, I, I, don't, I can't recommend any of the commercial methods of taking off, you know, um, dirt off of a symbol when Pisces put such a strong stance on it. Now, I will tell you, I used some groove juice on these symbols before I heard this whole thing about you're only supposed to use Pisces, and I've had no problems putting the groove juice to just kind of clean off my symbols, but my symbols are kind of new and they haven't really hurt the protective coating. Um, the giant, the interesting thing about the giant beads, over time they go from that greener color like this. This is still kind of green looking, but they eventually start to wear. And I've had this symbol since, let's see, what is this? This is um, 14. This was one of the first giant beats crash symbols I bought. And I've had this since 15 probably. And um, I have found that this symbol, you know, over time, it's just starting to get the, the Peisty, you know, copper sheen to it, you know. So this giant bee is going to eventually get rid of that green, beautiful green lacquer they put on it. It's going to go to more of that. And as you can see, the 15-inch giant bees, which I bought after the 18, but I play on all the time, they're starting to get that that coppery thing going on. So as the lacquer starts to wear off over time, what starts to happen is you start to get that copper patina on them, which looks more like 
this is more in line with the 2002s. But um, again, I don't know how to clean these symbols, and I haven't really done anything. Like, I, I did some really terrible things with Zildjian symbols early on, things like Brasso and all kinds of stuff. Um, I've heard things like try ketchup, um, but uh, to be honest, I don't. I wouldn't recommend even that. There's acidity in ketchup. Um, best thing you can do is take some, probably take some water and soap. That's the safest thing to do, so you don't take the logos off if that's your concern. Um, I don't know why they recommend that Piesty cleaner um, over over anything else um, that doesn't take it off, but. Um, for some reason they do. And I, I tend to not clean symbols. I will wipe them every day, once in a while with a damp cloth. I'll wipe them down a little bit, get some fingerprints off. But I'm really not a guy that cleans symbols. So uh, you're talking to the wrong guy. I like when symbols start to become patinaed and start to have their thing. But Pisces do look wonderful when they're brand new. I will tell you that. They just look wonderful. So I don't think I answered your question at all, Steve, but I gave it my best uh, try there. My next question comes from Drumman190. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so sorry to hear about Matthew's uh, studio kind of getting drowned by water, having water damage and stuff. So I can't wait to see more drum covers from him. And by the way, check out Drumman190's show, um, Five at Five. I don't know how, drum, how he's doing it, but he's getting these incredible guests. I mean, the guests he's had on between Benny Greb and Thomas Lang and... I thought Wilfredo Reyes from Chicago was a huge find, and the next week he brings in David Garibaldi. So I have I have nothing to say, but that's awesome, Matthew. And I must look at uh, Drum LCK too. Um, my only thing I would suggest to you guys is do a little more study on their background a little bit. Um, not that you don't do that, I mean, but really learn some of their favorite tracks like Garibaldi. I would ask some questions about back to Oakland, that album, because there's some really cool songs on there. Even though I know he's an incredible teacher, I think I would have thrown a few questions at him about some of his playing things, but, um, his playing has changed over time too. That's the interesting thing. How, how are you playing squib cakes today versus the way he played it back in 74, uh, 73, whenever that album came out. Back to Oakland's a classic album. I would recommend Back to Oakland, Tower Power to every drummer. Listen to that album. And you want to hear a guy playing the funkiest, the, the funkiest R&B soul grooves possible with the Tower, man. That That is a great album. So check that one out. But he, these guys are getting incredible interviews on there. So I have to commend them on that. So you guys are awesome. Let's see what question you have for my little crazy show. Uh, great show, Earl. Question for next show. You may have already been asked this, but can you tell us how you tune your drums? It's always cool to hear each drummer's method. Looking forward to your next live show. As always, your covers. Well, I would say I tune my drums to the music and the song and the vibe I'm going for. And I think a lot of my tuning method has to do with getting the dampening right to get the right vibe for the song I'm playing. Um, I don't have a specific, you do this, you do that, like Dave Weckl does. You know, Dave Weckl's got a way he tunes drums. Uh, when Chadwick Perry was on my show a couple, couple weeks ago, he was talking about how he follows pretty much the Dave Weckl method of doing it. Um, I will sometimes get the drum really in tune with itself. Pull the damp. This is the Chadwick method of dampening, too. So, I don't know. For me, I, I there's no really no rhyme or reason for me. Where is my drum key? Of course, the drum key is nowhere to be found when I need to do a drum key for a for this type of thing. Let me, uh, oh, I know where the drum key is. Hold on, hold on a second. Let me pull the drum key up. You'd think I'd have 500 of these. Drum key. So, let's see. You know, I usually... 
try to get the, the drum to sound just sound right to my ear. tuning method drum man i gotta tell you i pretty much tune drums to what i'm hearing that day and where i want it to be and then i put the dampening on to kind of get it in the zone you know i will say that i do like to have pronounced pitches between toms so you got a triad there going on um Sometimes when I have just two toms, there'll be a bigger, wider interval, you know? You know, but um, when I was in college, pitch and identifying pitches was always my biggest problem in life. And the most amazing thing about college I learned was that I could tune drums and guys were like, oh, I love the way your drums are tuned. And I really don't. I couldn't identify pitch real well. I struggled through ear training in college. I really struggled hard. So I've always never trusted my ear. But in actuality, when I listen to what I do in drum covers and how the toms sound, there is a way I tune. But I can't say, oh, I do a perfect, you know, it's a perfect fourth between the drums or a third. There's kind of a triad. There's a triad there. There's no doubt about that. Um, I just try to get the drum in tune with itself. Um, I think the bottom head is close, but it may be a little lower. Where I know some guys like to tune the bottom heads a little higher, like up uh, up one note or, you know, from their top head. Some guys do that. I mean, that's the kind of the bottom approach. He tuned the bottom heads tighter to the top head. Um, I don't always. That's not what I do. I want the notes to kind of go together and this is a tough these are two tough drums to get to tune together is 12s and 13s it's easier to go 10 12 14 or 10 13 16 where you got the break like Garibaldi was talking about this on your show he was talking about how he tunes the drums and he's got that those differences in size is even so he's got three inches off 10 13 16 um, that does something. And I kind of found that out myself when I, my first drum kit had 12, 13, 16, and it was always tough getting the 12 and the 13 to sound right. They're only an inch off each other. So I think it's easier when you have like 10, 12, there's two inches and then 12, 14, there's two inches. It kind of works to your advantage in tuning, but if you can get 12 and 13 to work together, it is a wonderful thing. What usually happens is one of these drums has to go a little bit lower than where it might want to be. And I think right now, um, for me, I can tune the 12 up higher. You know, I could go into the higher pitch land. But that's too high for me. I don't, I don't like the way it sounds there. So I probably have the 13 down a little bit lower than its range. Um, it's really, it's experimenting for me. It's finding that thing and it's a difference of a half step. Yeah, I'm still not happy with that. I'm gonna have to play with these a little bit now because I messed them up. But uh, I just did a cover on this uh, Bee Gees song. I will tell you, it doesn't take much to mess up drums, that's for sure. Nice new heads is always nice, too, for a while. Um, that, that's cool. Oh, I got the top head a little out. One of the things I will tell you about my tunings is I'm messing with this on camera. I like the growl. I like the lower pitch versus the higher pitch, to be honest. I always have. That's something I kind of live in, is that lower pitch thing versus the higher pitch. So I always start with that kind of bottom. But that's too far down, so I'm going to have to take it up a little bit. So I'm going to take it up a little. And when I'm tensioning, what I find is I kind of feel the tension in my hand more than anything else. I kind of feel like a, even a quarter turn, I can feel the 
the tensioning happening. And sometimes what I do is, once I get it in where I want it, then I'll, I'll take one of the lugs and I'll kind of back it off hard. Which might be this one today. This seems a little tighter. Now with a five lug drum, because they have to tune it down harder. I have, I kind of tune to the song and I mess with the drum until I fe feel like it sounds right. And then I dampen the drum so that the microphones pick up a certain sound that sounds right in the DAW. And then when I put my EQ, that I, my normal EQs I use, because I don't really change the EQs on my Tom channels. My EQs are kind of set. So I usually tune the drums a little bit. Every once in a while I put a little less compression, a little more compression. I'll put gating on it. Um, really what I do a lot of times is a little bit of reverb kind of changes everything. And that's kind of where I start from. But um, I got to be honest, I don't have a set way of tuning. Now snare drums, I, my snare drum trick is to have the bottom head tight. Very tight. I always have the bottom head super tight. Now this snare drum, to give you guys a picture of something. Uh, I have a different drum up today than I normally use. Uh, today, I've got my Gretsch, round badge Gretsch, chrome over brass, but the interesting thing about this, I've got Grover snares on it, very dry wire snares. These are kind of orchestral snares. Somebody gave them to me, and um, I don't like them on any other drum, but on this drum, it kind of sounds kind of cool. Matter of fact, I found the drum key. It was right here on the drum. <laughs> You guys know this about Gretsch drums, but they got a drum key. So, uh, um, I should have just looked there. So, very dry, you know? But it's a different, it's such a different brass sound than my Black Beauty. dampening this drum's got a certain vibe to it you know and that's the thing for me a lot of times with tuning is I go to dampening and guys don't like that for some reason they say I can't dampen you put one piece of moon gel on this thing and all of a sudden this drum is kind of cranking where it needs to be you know so So I pull this drum down for certain songs. That's what I do. It doesn't really get changed. It kind of stays in that zone. It's kind of the place where it goes. Matter of fact, there's a guy that's showing all his drum collection. That's a studio drummer named Mike Barrett. I've talked about him. Chavik and I talked a little bit about him last show. And I recommend you find his channel. And he's got these cool things. But um, he's got drums that he only uses for certain situations. And I think, like Chadwick was saying, too, you know, he's got his drums. And he pulls a drum down for a certain sound. I have enough snare drums, that that's what I usually do, but my favorite sounds are really the Noble Cooley and my Black Beauty for most things, and I will change the pitch of those occasionally. But uh, this has got its own vibe. But the bottom head is tight to get those snares to respond the way they do. I always have the bottom head tight. So, anyhow, I might have lost half the audience at that point, but <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, let's talk about, thank you, Matthew, for that great question. Though. That's a great question. Um, Let's see. Uh, the next question. Let's see. We had Steve, Matthew, uh, AR drummer, Adam. Oh, Adam said, congratulations on a million views. Have you ever played entry-level cymbals that you liked how they sounded? Now, Adam, AR drummer, is the king of entry-level drums and cymbals. He has all kinds of different... He, he goes to every... Goodwill, Salvation Army, 
um, swap meet um, flea market to find drums. He is the guy that finds more drums, and he finds a lot of great drums, but he's found a lot of other drums that I don't consider great drums, but he makes them sound great. He also does these things to cymbals that are just, to me, are crazy sometimes. Like, he tries to redo cymbals, and there are guys out there that recut cymbals. But um, he's asking me, are there any budget line symbols that I like. And the truth of the matter is one of the symbols that I use a lot is a budget line symbol from the late seventies, early eighties. That's the Piesty 505s. The Piesty 505s are the poor man's 2002s. Now today to get a 505, you're getting a cheaper, you're not really getting a cheaper symbol. It's in the ballpark of the 2002s because they sound that good. And from a budget perspective, from a student entry levels perspective, there was no better symbol than the 505s, in my opinion. I will say to you that the PST7s that Piesty's making today, entry level B8 symbols, rival the 505s. I don't have any of them because they usually come in sets, but um, my good friend Jim Flies 2 has them, Jim uses them. And Jim's a great drummer. He uses them for a lot of things, and they sound great. So the Piesty entry-level PST7s sound so much better than the, B, the B8 Pros from Sabian. Because Sabian doesn't do B8 right. Piesty does B8 the right way. They know how to do B8, and they do it well. So if you're looking for entry-level B8 symbols, I would stay away from the Sabians, and I would go for the, you know... Go for those. Now, Sabian's got a line that's a basically a remake of the, um, you know, the B20 symbols where they recast them or they recut them or whatever. Um, I forget what they're called now. I don't have any of those. But I would recommend going that route. But truthfully, there's not a lot. I mean, back in the day for me, there were Crut, Avante, um, Pearl made some, which looked, you know, they looked a lot like Piesty was making them for him. It was actually probably Meinl making them. I think a Piesty might have made Avante symbols too, by, by the way, entry-level symbols. But none of those symbols really did anything for me. I even had some Ludwig Standard nickel symbols that Piesty made. I thought they were terrible. Matter of fact, I don't even count them in my symbol collection, and I gave them away to people. I got them with, with some, some drum stuff from somebody once, and... Those are like, guys look for those symbols. <laughs> they want those symbols. They pay big money for them. It's just so bad. I've, thrown, I've given away such treasures to some, but that's, what, that's the truth of the matter is somebody, one man's junk is another man's treasure is truly when it comes to musical instruments today. Um, I will say this about the symbols that Adam likes and uses a lot of, a lot of the lower Wuhans and entry-level B8, B20 symbols um, today is that they sound just like a lot of the high-end Zildjian, you know, trash symbols that they make. You know, guys are looking for a trashier sound. They want, they want that. Now, this is a stack today. I have a stack on here. This is a, my uh, thin, peisty signature china on top of my signature 17-inch ozone, ozone crash or Swiss crash. Swiss crash. It's got a certain vibe, these nasty things. And I will say that Adam's nasty symbols sound just as good as this stuff. You know, if you're looking for that sound, which a lot of guys are today, then, you know, having some of those Wuhans are kind of cool. To me, my, the nastiest I ever really wanted was a China. You know, and Wuhan makes some nice china. So I have played Wuhan chinas, and I have some of those. They're excellent symbols, by the way, um, for that sound. But when it comes to budget line symbols, the the best I've ever played was the 505s. And I, if I could get some more 505s, I will get them. You know, they were just top notch. The PST sevens really good. Um, I've heard the alphas are really good. Piesty's made some really good budget line symbols that are B8 symbols, like the alpha, the old alphas. Not the new alphas, but the old alphas were really kind of good, I heard. 
Um, I think Keith Scott told me that. Anyhow, um, I don't know. When it comes to like the Zildjian, again, Zildjian and Sabian doing B B8, just they never did it right to me. Um, but I don't know. I'm a, I'm a simple snob, so you can all say that to me. <laughs> Adam actually says it in the question. He guys says, I always appreciate you taking time. I got another question from Adam. He says, what are your thoughts or experiences with the SR2 symbols? I think those are the ones that, um, I think the SR2s are the ones that are the remakes. Uh, regard getting burned out, you need, uh, he said to me, regard getting burned out, you need to do what you want when it comes to your YouTube channel and content. Make whatever makes you happy. I think we all get burned out or lose our motivation doing videos. Then we eventually get it back. You're right, Adam. That is correct. I'm on my way back up. Thank you for that encouragement. Um, the SR2s, again, I think you can get some really nice SR2s if you play them because they're remades. They basically took them back and they remade them, relayed them and stuff. So you can find some nice ones there. Um, so I, I think that's what Sabian does best. They're playing in their own world. They're playing in the B20 world. Sabian in the B20 world, Zildjian in the B20 world is their world. Um, Peisty in the B8 world, it's their world. Um, Peisty's got a B20 line, the, the Formula 602s, but they sound like the Formula 602s. Peisty's Formula 602s are not, they're, they're not trying to sound like Zildjian's. That's the difference. You know, and when you listen to a B8 Pro or the Zildjian equivalent of a B8 symbol, they don't do it right. They don't do it the way Peisty does it. So I don't think you get the same effect, and they sound cheap. And I've heard B, B8 Pros and B8 Symbols that just sound like garbage. I would never play those Symbols. You know, but when you played a Peisty 505 20-inch ride, it sounded great. 16-inch Crash sounded great. 18-inch China sounded great. 20-inch Crash sounds great. I have one. I mean, great-sounding Symbols that you can use. That's what you want in a starter kit, in a student level kit. And if you look at the prices, the PST7s are probably in comparison to the B20s, the Sabian B20, uh, B8s, excuse me, Sabian B8s are probably comparable or maybe even a few dollars less, who knows? So that's what I'm saying. And as far as like every other Tom, Dick and Harry symbol company today, there's so many symbols out there to find something unique. So you can find anything you want today. And there's so many sounds. And what, what's one man's junk is another man's treasure. For me, I like symbols that sound like pretty symbols like I grew up with. So I'm looking for that sound. That's the vibe I'm going for. Um, I don't know. I'm really a cymbal snob, though. <laughs> I am the cymbal snob. I will play almost any drum and make it kind of work. But as long as it's got a good snare drum and some cymbals that I, I can deal with, you know, that's that's my thing. All right, uh, Stuart Barrett, Killer Pocket Earl, what's your thoughts on vintage snare drums? Maybe like 1920s Ludwig. I hear the that vibe in your snare drum. Thank you for that. Um, you probably you know, I was playing a Black Beauty on the tune he was talking about. Um, from what I've heard about the really, really old vintage Black Beauties and stuff, is that they really, the snare mechanisms aren't that great. Now, when we talk about vintage 70s Black Beauties, there could be a slight difference in the, the thickness of the brass or a vintage um, 50s, you know, brass superphonic, certain vibe. But, you know, the funny thing about my 5x14 Black Beauty is that I heard in that, that classic brass superphonic sound that I wanted. Because I played a brass superphonic in the 80s, and I didn't realize what a gem it was. And it was used, and it cost about the same amount of money as the Pearl Free Floater. I told this story once, uh, I think on Stories About the Gear. And um, the Pearl Free Floater is what I bought. And that's where I got my nickname, The Hammer, from. Playing that drum, and the lead singer said, what are you going to hammer me? Gonna, gonna put a nail through my head you're gonna hammer me down so i'm gonna call you the hammer and he started calling me that name but it came because of that snare drum but that that um brass superphonic from the 50s that drum sounded a lot like that 5x14 brass that i played and when my friend came in the studio 
Ken Burton came in the studio and he said, hey, you know, I brought, I got this Black Beauty. I played it. I was like, wow, this sounds great. I said, what can I do to try get that drum? He goes, well, you give me the, the Phosphorus Bronze Ludwig. That's the only drum I'll take for it. So I gave him a six and a half by 14 Phosphorus Bronze to get my five by 14 Black Beauty. The Black Beauty gets more comments than any other drum I have when I play it on a, on a, on a cover. Guy said, I love the sound of that snare drum. So I know the Black Beauty is, is a vintage kind of sound, even today. That's a 2009, so I think it's the 100th anniversary Black Beauty. I don't think there was anything special about it to the you know 2010 version, but it did come out in the 100th anniversary of that drum. So, But um, I think if you find like a vintage Radio King, the problem with the older drums is they could be out of round on the older wood drums. So you got to be careful with that. But if you find one that's in round and sounds great to you, buy it. You know, the problem is people want so much money for vintage now that it's gotten out of control. So if you're going to spend, if you're going to spend $1,500 on a, you know, a rebuilt Radio King from the 1930s, you know, if that's what you're going to do. I mean, I tell you to go out and buy a Craviato or a Noble Cooley, you know, because Noble Cooleys, you know, are great drums and get a new one is great. I mean, they sound as good as the, the old ones. Now I've got an old Noble Cooley. It's from the nineties. I had it refinished and it's probably got a little bit of age to the wood now. So maybe it sounds a little bit more different than the new ones, but not that much. I mean, not enough for anybody could tell it or any microphone is going to tell it. There's a crack to a solid shell snare drum. There's a crack to um, a brass shell snare drum. You know, there's a crack to certain depths of snare drums. So snare drums are very much has to do with what the size of the drum is and what the shell material is and what the bearing edges are. And with vintage drums, you can find a great one, but it could be hit or miss if the, if the bearing edges are good. So there's a lot of factors when you're buying a vintage drum. Make sure you go try it out make sure it does what you want it to do and sounds like you want it to sound. Um, I mean, a Black Beauty from the 1920s is going to cost you a lot of money. Is it going to play the better than this Black Beauty that I have right here? Probably not. It's going to probably play worse and you're going to be afraid to play it if you spend four or $5,000 for a Black Beauty from the 1920s. So are they cool to have? Yeah. If somebody gave you one, would I take it? Yeah. <laughs> Will I spend five grand for one? No, that's not going to happen. I'm not a vintage collector. I'm a player of snare drums. So I want drums I can play. That's the key. That's my key criteria in buying equipment. Am I going to play it? If I'm going to play it, I want it. If I'm not going to play it, I don't want it. And that's why my kits look the way they do. I've got this vintage Gretsch kit that I've had from since I bought it. This is my kit, my original kit. It's got my holes. It's got my drills in it. He's got, it's got a lot of things wrong with it, a lot of marks on it. But you know what? They're mine. They sound great. The vintage uh, concert tom kit. It's got a certain vibe. I picked that up because it had a certain vibe. I love playing that vibe sometimes. There's nothing better than playing 70s concert toms on a 70s song. It just sounds right. Um, there's nothing wrong with playing double-headed toms on those songs, but the vibe of some of those songs were, you could, were clearly concert toms, so it's nice to bring out that vintage vibe when you got it. Um so I love vintage drums, and I've had some great ones, and I've lost some great ones. But um, it all that comes down to what you're willing to pay for something. And I will tell you that that's, it's just like paying for a K Zildjian ride from Istanbul, an Istanbul K. You better listen to it and make sure it's what you really want before you spend two grand on it. That's all I'll say to you. Because you might be able to get that sound with a, you know, a phosphorus or an istanbul mehet or a gop symbol today or a zildjian constantinople or a karope you may get that sound you're looking for for a lot less money than spending two or three thousand dollars on a really old 22 inch istanbul ride that really doesn't sound the way you want it to sound so that's the thing you've got to hear it make sure it's it's the vibe you want you know, and then when you get it, you start playing it for a while, you start to go, yeah, it's not really the vibe I want. That's what happened with the Karope. 
I love that 22 inch croaked ride symbol when I bought it. And now it's almost seven, eight years gone by. And I realize I don't pull it out because my ears have gone to more what really records well. And I really like Pisces. So what did I do? I went out and bought a, a Zildjian Abydos 22 and I love it. Sounds great. Beautiful symbol. Um, you can crash it. You can ride it. Beautiful symbol. And it's going to make my Zildjian setup that much better. But the crope is what the crope is, man. If I'm playing that kind of a gig where I need that really light vibe of the crope, I got it. So I'll pull it out for those gigs. Uh, maybe someday I'll do the Avidus and the crope on the same setup. You know, I have two big symbols somewhere. That, that's kind of a cool vibe. I may even try that at church sometime. That might be kind of fun, actually. Um, but, again, it's all what you're going for. It's the sound you're going for. That's what I always say. So, all right. And my last question comes from Lori Jones. And Lori Jones says to me, says, uh, here's the question. Here it goes. Um, morning, you're all sorry for the confusion. My, my ask girl anything is how we cope with bad drumming days. For whatever reason, we can't play or it doesn't sound right. And you can't get into the groove. Advice for novices and long-term players. I guess the best thing to do is to stop playing and try again later. Or perhaps play something easy. Are you doing a hang this weekend? That, that was yesterday I got this question, right before we did this. This is Sunday. Um, and I didn't do a hang, by the way. Uh, there are certain days when I'm not playing well. It usually has to do an inspiration. You know, and if you're playing a piece of music for a cover reason or something, where you don't have inspiration, then it's hard to muster it up, you know, and practice it. So uh, sometimes I'll sit down and play the kit, and I don't have any vibe at all. I just, I'm, I'm not hearing. The drums don't sound right to me. They don't feel right to me. I'll play for two or three minutes. I'll walk away. You know, that just happens. But when I have to perform... When I have a gig or I have to rehearse for a gig, I will get my stuff together and come outside of myself to play stuff. And that's what a professional does. A professional will play anything and make it sound right when you have to do it. The problem is you have no reason you have to do anything when you work in a home studio and all you're doing is making drum covers for people that might watch your video and might not watch your video. You know, there's really no reason you have to do anything. So with that being said, if you're not feeling inspiration, Lori, then what I would say to you is, yeah, stop playing. Go take a break. Maybe pick a different piece of music. There are days when I'm in here and I pick a piece of music and it's not happening. And I'll just shelve it. You know, I don't I don't always succeed. Now I do a lot of music on weekends just for the fun of it. You know, I I just kick stuff out that makes me fun. But sometimes I just have to pick some easy stuff that I know I'm gonna blow right through just to get a couple little bit of momentum going and warm up and then I'll try a harder piece because what I want to do is I want I want to play the harder pieces. I want to play things that I think are challenging to me. But sometimes I got to get a couple easy ones under the belt before I start. So that's what happened with the Bee Gees tune I released yesterday on on Saturday. Um I actually did that Friday evening. But first I um I did a tune called Everyday People by Sly and the Family Stone. I mean, that song was just easy. I just sat down and kind of just, just locked it in, you know? And then I went and played the Bee Gees tune, and I had more chops and I had more stuff going on. I was able to pull it together. So sometimes you have to warm up, you know, and you start with something easy, and then you work to something harder. But don't, don't ever get yourself all bummed out if you can't make something happen. And the only thing I can say to you is if you're on a gig where things are not happening... Go to simple and make it work. You know, that's what I do. When the band's not the greatest band I'm playing with, I just lock it into simple and make it work and make the band sound good. And that's another thing that's the art of playing with people is being able listening to other players where they're at and making them sound as good as they can sound. And drums have a way of making things sound good or bad, depending on what you do. So... If you're a drummer that plays a lot of stuff in your practice room and you can play all kinds of stuff, that's awesome. It looks cool on camera, too. But if you go out on a gig with somebody and the musicians you're playing with are not at that level 
and you're trying to play all that stuff, you may throw them off the left field and the band will sound terrible. So know what you're playing to the people you're playing with too. That's another very important part, especially when you start playing with people. Now, if your goal is to just play drum covers and get lots of chops, then you know, keep practicing. That's, that's cool. But my goal has always been to play with people. That's my, that's my goal. And that's what YouTube is for me. I, this YouTube is allowing me to play with some of my favorite people as I get rid of the favorite drummer that I'm playing the song of, you know, because if I play a song, it's because I like the song. And that meant that drummer was amazing on it to me. So it did something that inspired me. So, and that's the key here is be inspired by what you're doing. So pick stuff that you enjoy doing and stuff that inspires you to play. But, um, yeah, that, that's the key to the whole thing for me. Is that's, that's what I do. So um, I get to play with great musicians by getting rid of the drummer that I love. <laughs> I love the drum, drumming on the song. Uh, have, have fun with that. But um, anyhow, that, that's all I got on that one, Lori. Yeah, inspired, get inspired. A couple things else I want to say on the way out the door. I don't, because I never know who's going to hear this stuff. Anyhow, watch this to the end. Um, a guy I've talked about on this channel, uh, Dave Jones, a friend of mine. Um, Dave's got a son. His name is Zach Jones. And Zach is an amazing drummer. I've talked about this. He's played with um, – he plays in New York City, plays in the Brooklyn scene in New York City. He's played with some uh, pop acts of the 2000s, 2010s. But he's also worked with Sting. And um, last week um, I got a – I got a, a text message from his father who said that he was in Italy with Sting playing a show for Josh Freeze. And I just want to say how proud I am of Zach Jones. Jack, Zach Jones was a little kid when I showed him how to play a, one of the grooves. I don't know which groove I showed him. His father says I taught him how to play Come Together by the Beatles. I'm sure I taught him wrong, but I taught my interpretation of how to do it. But it's possible. Um, I probably showed him a couple other things. But... Um, Zach playing with Sting on Josh Freeze's kit is pretty cool. Matter of fact, I may try to share a little piece of that at the end of this, just so you can see. You can't, can't really see him too well because there's the camera shot from the show. Some guy sitting up in the nosebleeds, but um, it's my friend's son, Zach, on drums. And he's laying it down, and I just want to congratulate him. I think he did awesome, and... Uh, I know a lot of people have poured into his life, and I was happy to show him a few things. He's an incredible drummer, and one that may, you may hear about someday. Matter of fact, if you got any of the last two Sting albums, he's been on one or two cuts of each one of those albums, so it's kind of funny. Um, Sting must dig his plan, so that, that's all that matters here. Uh, and that's how you get gigs. People like what you do, you know? And he learned from his dad like I'm talking to you, the things I'm telling you guys about getting gigs and working with people, Zach was told at a young age. Zach was playing drums in church, and when, you know, things I might have done with his father, he started working at his dad's church when he was really young, and he learned how to play with older musicians, the guys I was playing with a lot of times with his dad, and those guys all taught him how to play with people and play with musicians. And if you want to get gigs with this, you want to get out in the real world with this, you got to learn how to play with other musicians. And I guess I think that's getting lost in our YouTube world. It's getting lost on Instagram. And old guys like me see this. And I want to encourage you young, young players, play with musicians. Play in church. Play gigs with your bands. Play in the garage. Get together with musicians and play music. Because that's where you learn how to play with others. That's how you learn how to be an artist and you learn how to make music. And you can get so stuck in books, so stuck in playing covers, that you never get out and play music. So play music with other musicians. So important to your growth. And if you do that, as you get older, you'll keep doing it. You'll keep, you'll keep playing if you find your way in there. And that's what I want to say to you is, like, find your way. Um, Drums is an instrument you need other musicians to play. That's why I play with music. I don't find a lot of cool things in just playing solo after solo. I think I would be pretty done pretty soon. I think any drummer only plays what they play. It's their thing. The only guy I can think that's always making stuff up and keeps growing is Vinnie Caliuta. 
I mean, I don't see him repeating himself that often. He seems to go somewhere else somehow. But he, if you asked him, he'd probably say, no, I'm repeating myself. I hear it in Steve Gadd's play, and Steve Gadd repeats himself. He's been playing the same stuff for a long time. He plays differently, and he plays it slightly different, but it's if you go back and listen to early, like late 70s, early 80s, and 80s music, where Gadd's playing some of his riffs, it's the same riffs. He's been building on those same things for a long time. So you get a vocabulary to a certain point. But what happens when you play with musicians is your vocabulary expands with the musicians you're playing with. So if all you're doing is playing your basement and playing your licks, you may get great at playing licks, but how does it come off playing with other musicians? And how does that take you to another level? So that's where growth is. Growth can go into another level. Anyhow, probably overstayed my welcome on this show today. <laughs> Um, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. And thanks for watching Ask Girl Anything. Your questions make the show. Ask some questions. And have a great day. Yeah.